mark a series of conversation on the letter of Paul to the Colossians. It's so rich and so uh, profound uh, as we have discovered in the last four uh, Sundays, the beauty, the depth of this letter of Apostle Paul to the Colossians. And it's, we are so grateful nowadays in the 21st century that this first century document was preserved in order for us to have a glimpse of what the challenges the early believers, our brothers and sisters who were first runners before us, were facing during that uh, a period of time. So we entitled this series, if you're uh, uh, keen to follow, and I hope you will catch up with our YouTube and uh, Vimeo channels, all the four videos were already uploaded, so you can actually uh, do a marathon either this week or tonight that you may be able to catch up the thread of our conversation and the beautiful uh, <clears throat> thought and messages of Paul to the Colossian believers. The title of the series that we have given is Christful, the fullness of Christ, because the Lord, through Apostle Paul, was calling them to Christian maturity. So the entire letter of Apostle Paul to the Colossians was a call for them to continue in their Christian walk, in their Christian maturity, no matter uh, the pressures around them. And last Sunday, uh, we saw the central passage of Colossians chapter 2, 6, uh, 6 to 7, that, is, that summarizes, that encapsulates the entire message of Apostle Paul to this small church in Colossae, where he encouraged them that since you have received Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, continue to live in Him. So it summarizes in that two verses a call to Christian maturity because Apostle Paul believed that when you grow into maturity in Christ, you'll be able to discern, you'll be able to know the truth, and you will be able to stand on that truth, solid, disciplined, firm against all these heresies that are threatening the unity and the sound, soundness of the early church in the first century. So a call to Christian maturity. So last Sunday, just a recap for those of you who were not with us. Our salvation, this is what Apostle Paul, what we have drawn from Apostle Paul's message in chapter 2, 6 to 15. Our salvation in Christ is fully sufficient, not deficient. Simply because the false teachers that were surrounding the, Col the Colossian believers were confusing them sowing doubts in their hearts, saying that what Christ has done on the cross was not sufficient. That's why you have to do and add some rituals and some observances of the law in order for you to be completed, uh, to be integrated fully into the family of Abraham. And so Apostle Paul right away arrested that thought and said, these are not true. Get rid of them. Don't listen to them because your salvation in Jesus Christ, as far as Christ's Victory on the cross is concerned. It is fully sufficient and it is not deficient. And he used beautiful metaphors and images in the first century that we were able to understand last week. Like he disarmed the power of evil and darkness. So he canceled them, the, the legal obligations, those, the IOU letters that because you have owed the, uh, the law, you are not able to fulfill the law. Therefore, you owe the law and these are all the things. And Apostle Paul beautifully painted it and said, Jesus Christ took that letter, took that legal charges against you by the law, and nailed it on the cross. Nullify it, cancel it, and not only that, he actually disarmed the power of evil and darkness that made the salvation we have in Christ fully sufficient, not deficient. So let's move to our series number 5 in Colossians chapter 2, 16 to 23. We'll just focus on these few verses. Realize in Christ. There are so many things that we need to understand. There are things that Christ has already accomplished and has been realized in the coming of the Messiah that is so significant for us in our journey as Christ followers because there, again, the, the false teachers that were roaming around in the Colossian church were trying again to derail them and uh, sway them and distract them about the things that Christ has already accomplished when He came. So realize in Christ. In this passage, in this portion of Colossians 16 to 23 in particular, this is actually uh, what Paul was trying to say to the Colossian believers and for all of us 
uh, readers of this beautiful letter. The promise age to come, according to Apostle Paul, the promise age to come is now a present reality in Jesus Christ. Pastor Boots, what does it mean? You, it gets clearer as we go along with the passage of Apostle Paul. But again, in the Old Testament, God promised the Israelites that someday, because this world is broken, I will put an end to this present evil age. And the age to come will happen when the Son of Man will come or the, the day of the Lord will happen and will come and He will put an end to this evil age and then the age to come, the promised age, the new order that God has promised to His people where He would renew the world and He would redeem this creation, this entire creation, will only take effect when the Son or the, or the, the, the day of the Lord will happen and the, again, God will return finally to put an end to this. So all the Jewish people in the Old Testament were looking forward in anticipation, longing and expectation that someday this present evil age that we lived in today will come to an end. And Apostle Paul in Colossians, in these few verses, very subtly and very beautifully, Apostle Paul wrote to the Colossian believers and reminded them why they have to continue to live in Christ and live in the new creation because the promised age to come that God has given to His people is already a present reality in Jesus Christ. So in this paragraph of chapter 2, 16 to 23, Apostle Paul addresses specifically and disarm again the legalistic practices and the ritualistic observances that threaten the sufficiency of Christ's work on the cross. He's more specific this time. Last week is a bit the, uh, the, Jewish, uh, the Jewish legalistic approach that they were asked to do the Sabbath and all these things and the circumcisions. Again, Paul would address that in a very specific and a direct manner, including some of the pa pagan ritualistic observances that were common in the first century. So in this small paragraph, just to give you a, a big picture first before we dive in, Apostle Paul wrote two warnings. <clears throat> so as we go along, watch out for the two warnings that Apostle Paul gave. In the two warnings, he gave two reasons why we have to disregard all this uh, nonsense, uh, philosophies and teachings. So Apostle Paul will give two warnings and he will give two reasons at the same time. And at the end of the paragraph, he would give a rhetorical question and an explanation why. It's very, very sovereign how Apostle Paul would flow would write the flow of his argument again to continue what he has said that if our salvation in Christ is fully sufficient and not deficient, then this is the argument that he's saying again in continuity to that uh, message of Apostle Paul. So here again, as we dive to verse 16, if, this is the premise of the last sermon, of the last passage, if our salvation is fully sufficient and not Deficient. Here comes Apostle Paul. Therefore, if what Christ has done on the cross is complete, victorious, sufficient, and completed, therefore, oh, he's concluding, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon, celebration, or a Sabbath day. Here comes Apostle Paul giving us the first warning. The Colossian believers, pay attention. Therefore, since we have victory in Christ, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat. So in, in this verse, you will see Paul is talking about eating and drinking because apparently these religious leaders were saying, no, you should not eat this, you should not eat that, or you should observe this festival and do this Sabbath. Obviously, he is pointing again and continuing his discussion with the Jewish legalistic teachers that were trying to confuse the believers. Again, you said you believe in Christ, you're part of the church, that's good, but you're not yet fully integrated into the family of Abraham because you're not eating kosher food. food kosher, kosher food, don't, those that are only eaten by the Jews. They have a lot. In Leviticus, in the book of Leviticus, there's so many uh, prohibitions. Don't, do, don't, don't eat this, don't eat. God has his reason why he commanded the Israelites to do this in the, first, uh, in the, in the Old Testament. So the Jewish people were uh, distinct as a community, they would not eat certain kinds of food. So these legalistic teachers were, 
pressuring the believers in Colossae, since you are claiming to be worshiping the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, why are you eating all these things? Why are you eating unclean foods? Just like the Jewish people were eating such kind of food. And why are you not doing these religious festivals or the moons and celebration or, or Sabbath day? Why are you not observing the Sabbath day? And Apostle Paul, this is very revolutionary in the first century, especially speaking from an apostle who was a Jew. Do not let anyone judge you, condemn you. Again, Romans 8.1 says, Apostle Paul would say, Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Wala nang condemnation to those who are in Christ. So, Paul again echoing here, if there's, someone, if there's anyone there in your church trying to judge you because of what you eat or drink or because of holy festivals that you fail to observe, do not let them judge you. Why? Why, Apostle Paul? Later on, he will explain. But very, very observant. You have to focus your minds in understanding what Apostle Paul, every word that he was saying. So, eating, drinking. Let's talk about that. What did... So, how's the evolution and the progress, Pastor Boots? Kailangan ba pa natin kumain ng dinuguan? Kailangan ba... Di, mga Filipino, in our, count, in our context, we ask all those questions. Don't do this, don't do that. Not allowed to eat. And the first thing that comes to our mind, so what do we do now, Pastor Boots? I'll give you a back view of what Jesus said when He was still on earth and ministering to the Jewish people in Israel. Where again, they were accused in Mark chapter 7, the religious leaders accused... Jesus and his disciples, why are your disciples eating with unclean foods or without washing their hands and so on and so forth? And in this context, Jesus said something very revolutionary that really questioned uh, that a lot of leaders questioned him of his faithfulness to the Torah, to the Old Testament, the Jewish law. And here's a glimpse of chapter 7 of Mark. That's the context they were questioned about why are they eating with unclean hands and so on and so forth. And the disciples... <coughs> Because in response, Jesus gave them a parable, a two-sentence parable. When they have their time of quiet and privacy, they asked Jesus, what do you mean by that parable? And then Jesus responded this way. He said, don't you understand either? He asked, can't you see that the food you put into your mouth or in your body cannot defile you? Food doesn't go into your heart, but only po- passes through the stomach and then goes to the, the sewer. Mark gave us a footnote by saying this, as if we cannot really understand. So Mark, see Mark is making it easy for us. As if Mark is saying, uh, by saying this, Jesus, he declared that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. Because when Jesus said this, it took them many years before Mark wrote that gospel, looking back in retrospect. So he had to put that footnote for the readers uh, of Mark during that time and for us in the first century that what Christ was trying to say is that Every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. In other words, at that juncture, Jesus abolishes the ceremonial laws pertaining to food in Leviticus. That made him very, very controversial. Let that sink in for a while. Wow. That's why Apostle Paul in the New Test in the letters would echo and say, whether therefore you eat or drink whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. Of course, there are some issues about conscience. Apostle Paul would talk about that in 1 Corinthians. If there's a brother who does not eat for any reason, because of you, I will not eat it. Just to, Not because it's bawal. Not because it's prohibited in this. No, I'm doing it because of love. So we are now being bound, uh, ruled, and guided by the love of Christ that I won't do it for your sake. Not because it's not allowed. Now, there are so many reasons why we don't eat what we don't eat. But don't give any religious meaning to it. Simply because I don't eat that dahil matataas yung aking high blood. Mataas na nga, high blood pe. There are some food that is beneficial for us. There are some food that alam na nga natin may sakit tayo. Eh. And kain ka pa ng kain nun. And don't give any religious meaning to it. With common sense and sober mind, let's not eat what is not beneficial for us. Because we have to take care of our bodies as living sacrifices offered to God. That is the most responsible way. Don't give any spiritual meaning because I am a Christian, I don't eat this. Those are, oh, Jesus said, what comes into your mouth does not defile you. As the Jewish people would look at it, akala nila by eating all those things, with respect to them, they would eat those things because they believe out of their legalistic mind that they would have spiritual life, that they would be more holier than others because simply of the food that they ate, the dietary rules. Jesus said, no, 
it has, your diet has nothing to do you with your spirituality. Simply because I eat this kind of food, I'm more spiritual than you. Simply because you eat that kind of food, you're carnal. No, there's no such thing. So Jesus, what defiles a man is what comes out of his heart. And then in the passage, he would say, because in your heart, there are hidden immorality, hatred, greediness, and so on and so forth. So what, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Wow, Jesus is so, so bland. It is not about what you eat because they are trying to judge the... You are defiling yourself because you did not wash your hands spiritually and so on and so forth. Jesus arrested that. And here Paul, without even elaborating that, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or the festivals. All these things may affect sa species maturity ng isang tao. It has an effect on the maturity and the, sp- the spiritual growth because as you continue to grow in the Lord, you'll be able to know and understand that your body is God's temple. You also have to take care of your body. Meaning what I eat, what I do with my body, I will be accountable to God who gave this body to me. It includes what I eat. It includes what I do. It includes how many hours I sleep and how I abuse my body. Because that's true. Because some, most of the time, our spirituality is imbalanced. So here's Jesus saying that. And let me, let me go back to what Paul said. Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon, a celebration, or a Sabbath. Alam niyo po ba yung mga Israelites, just to give you a backstory, when they observe Sabbath, it's not only because they were dressed on the seventh day. The original intention of God was good. But through the years, nahaluan ng kung ano-anong human uh, concept and legalistic way that it has become very legalistic in its approach. Now, it's no longer serving according to the purpose of God why God gave them the Sabbath for them. To rest, to remember their labor in Israel or in Egypt that God has delivered them. Another factor about Sabbath is this. Listen carefully. Beautiful. The Jewish people, when they observe Sabbath, one of the spiritual... <clears throat> Uh, significance of Sabbath and implication is for them to rest for one day, to meditate on God's uh, goodness, and at the same time to have a foretaste. Listen carefully. When they observe Sabbath, they would keep themselves quiet and observe with worship, remember Yahweh and the Word of God. They would read. The pur- one of the purposes for them to have a glimpse, a foretaste of the coming age to come. That they would look, it, it's all pointing forward. Every time they would observe Sabbath, it is always pointing forward as a signpost. Pointing forward, this is like experiencing now in a day, in a 24 hours, what it means to live in the age to come. So the Sabbath observance for the Jews gives them a foretaste of what it feels like when the age to come has arrived or will arrive. So I want you to catch that. So all the Jews, every time they would have Sabbath, they would, because they would stop from all the, their dominial works and all these distractions that they have been doing through the week and concentrate on what God has promised that someday God would put an end to this evil age and He would renew and He will give us an eternal rest into His presence where His presence is fully sufficient to nourish us and stop from all these things, these worldly things that we have been doing and concentrate on God's faithfulness. Even all the festivals, the Passover, the Pentecost, the Tabernacle, and all this unleavened bread, all of them are signposts pointing forward to what God has promised. Now here's Apostle Paul. Why he said, do not let anyone judge you on these things because these, in verse 17 he continued, because these are a shadow. Listen carefully, catch this. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. So these, were, these are signposts. These are referring to the festival that thou shalt not eat, all the ceremonial laws that God has given to the Jewish people in the Old Testament. These are a shadow of the things that were to come, pointing to the future as signposts. And then Paul said, the reality of that shadow is found in Christ. In other words, Apostle Paul is saying all these regulations of the Old Testament of the Jewish people were given, but these are shadows of the object 
that is yet to come. And Paul is saying, why do I tell you, Colossians, to do not let anyone judge you because of all this shadow? Because you have already the object, you have the reality in Christ. Everything is realized in Christ. You don't embrace the shadow when you have the reality. I was supposed to show you a picture. I shared this story before many times. I was sent here to Singapore, 1994, May. Ten days ahead of Sister Manjo and Nichelle. My daughter, our daughter, was six months old. I left him in the Philippines. <laughs> I was sent to Singapore. In principle, my employment pass, my pass was approved, so I had to come <clears throat> only to discover <laughs> that I was not entitled to have dependent. But I was here ten days before Sister Manju. So I was staying in one of the shop houses there in Neil Road, the third floor. I was alone. Almost every night, I'm in tears. I miss my family, my daughter, Nichelle, and my wife, Manju. I had this picture of them. I would always look at them before I sleep, sleep with them, uh, embracing this picture. For the past 10 days, at the most loneliest time I've ever had in, in Singapore, because that's the first time I was separated from them. But I was counting the days, the long days, the long hours, 10 days of waiting. I could not wait. I would travel to airport just to practice how to travel to airport. I would hope to see my family every day, mga kapatid. I would eat my lunch before sleeping. There was no phone. We don't have cell phone. We don't have Zoom where you can talk to your family abroad, back home. And the day came. They would arrive, Terminal 2, I can still remember, vivid in my memory. Terminal 2, 6 o'clock in the evening. I was there at 2 o'clock. Baka madelay eh. <laughs> Ako madelay, hindi sila. And I could not wait. My, he my neck was so long looking for, for them. When, when they came out, I carried Nichelle. Nichelle was like, who is this Chinese guy? I was so like, he could not, she could not recognize me. In 10 days. But how foolish it will be for me that when they have arrived, that I'm still embracing the picture and kissing the picture where Sister Manju is already there, alive, vibrant, and kicking. Of course, I have to put that picture down and embrace my family. The reality is here. That's exactly what Apostle Paul is saying. These are shadow of the things that were to come. But do not let anyone judge you of all these things because the reality now is found in Christ. Now, I want you to listen carefully and watch this diagram. I have shared this already, but this is a very important diagram for us to understand what Paul was actually driving here. So the Jewish people believe that what we are living now is the present age, evil age, because it was broken in the creation because of man, when man fall to sin, Adam. Because of that, the world is broken, and we are living in a broken world. And they only believe, they believe that the, the age to come, the promised restoration and the healing and redemption and everything will come. This present evil age will only be broken and will only be put to stop on the day of the Lord. And then the age to come or the age of God, the new order will begin. So that was their expectation. That was their anticipation and long. Yes, kuntinti is na lang. The Messiah will come and everything will come to an end. He will put an end to this evil age. And we all know, if you were with us during our series on Galatians, here's a new diagram. So in this diagram, you will notice Jesus Christ arrived, the cross. When the cross arrived, that was an unexpected twist and turn. They, would, they could not believe that when the, mess, that the, the, the Savior would come in the middle of history, when Jesus Christ was born, died and rose again, the age to come has arrived. That is what we call the already and the not yet. It, has, it is now a present reality and there is still a future fulfillment to it. And the second coming of Jesus, Jesus is coming on the second time. That will be the completion. But the age to come or the future has already bro broken into the present when Jesus Christ was born. That's why the, the preaching of Christ is the behold, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom has, has, been, has been launched 
on the resurrection of Jesus. So in this diagram, I want you to see that Paul was saying anything before Christ is our shadows of the things to come. The things to come. The reality has come. Last week, Apostle Paul mentioned and taught us in the, the last paragraph that when you were baptized, you were dead in Christ. The, the demarcation line of this present evil, although the present evil age continue, and again, it will come to an end on the second coming of Jesus, but little did they realize that when Christ was born, rose again on the third day, the kingdom of God has a soft launching. No wonder in Matthew 28, Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. That was the official launching of the kingdom of God. Expand the kingdom of God. So what we are doing as we share the gospel is extending the kingdom of God. Many people who would open their hearts become part of the kingdom of God. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. When you put your faith in Christ, boom, you start to see the move of God and the kingdom of God and you are integrated into the family of God. But other than that, those things are, sabi ni Paul, those are shadows of the things to come. And these people who are confusing you are letting you focus on the shadow rather than the reality that has been fulfilled in Christ. Beautifully. In other words, Apostle Paul was saying, Jesus is the goal of Israel's scripture. Tell the Jewish people who are trying to tell you, Colossians, to bring you back to synagogue, to lead you again into captivity. Tell them that the goal of the scripture is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the end and the completion of the law. He is the Messiah, is the true substance of the Torah. Jesus came to fulfill everything. In Jesus Christ, the true Israel all the Old Testament requirements of the ceremonial and everything was fulfilled in Christ. He is the goal of the Hebrew Scripture. So that was the first warning. Do not let anyone judge you. Why? He gave the reason. Because these are shadows of the things to come wherein the reality is already in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, in verse 18, he gave the second warning. Now, let's pay, pay attention. Do not let anyone, again he repeated, in the first warning, do not let anyone judge you. Here, do not let anyone who delight in false humility and worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person, he gives a reason, also goes into a great deal about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. Hey, wait on, Apostle Paul. What do you mean? Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and worship of angels disqualify you. The word disqualify is the word that, the picture of an umpire. It's like a referee that, that disqualifies you or terminates you or rob you. The picture here is to rob you. Do not let anyone rob you of the price or to disqualify you in the competition. Who are these people that, that plays the role of an umpire that tells you that you are not qualified, that you are not part of the game anymore, that disqualifies you? They are not, they are not the, the one that will dictate and tell you, do not let these people do the umpire thing and to do the referee thing. They are not authorized to do that, in other words. And then Paul said, such person also goes into a great deal about what they have seen. What is he talking about? Ito pong mga uh, false teachers in Colossae trying to impress the Colossian young believers of their visions, what they have seen. The visions, you know, I have the visions of the heavens and I was caught up in heaven and so on and so forth. Maybe they were bragging about those things and they were actually arrogant. They were puffed off with idle notions of spiritual mind. Actually, yung mga pa-spiritual, yun yung hindi spiritual. There's always one like that or some like that in the church that always that will try to impress you that they are spiritual people. You know, Pastor Booth, I, I had a dream. I saw Jesus. There's so many quento about visions and they, you know, Apostle Paul was caught up to the third heaven and he dared not to say what he saw. What he saw. Did you see that in 2 Corinthians? Apostle Paul was caught up in the third heaven, as Apostle Paul would mention that, and he even dared not to say or write about all these things. Well, on the other hand, sometimes we, we tell those stories just to make an impression that I am I'm more spiritual than you and so on and so forth. This is actually what's happening in Colossae. 
They even have the false humility. Ano yung false humility? Usually associated po, one Bible scholars explain, maybe, maybe because of their fasting. Because fasting is sometimes required in your prayer so that you will have an, a, a, an experience of the divine. The mysticism that Paul was attacking here is that you will have uh, a certain key experience, uh, spiritual experience, miraculous experience because you are fasting and prayer and praying and so on and so forth. And even the worship of angels, that they, maybe they would claim that they were like part of the worship of angels. Or, you know, I attended, I, had, I was caught up in heaven, I attended the worship of angels. Well, most of the time, maybe what you have seen is just a figmentation of your imagination and your hallucination or whatever, as lo- whether, especially when it is not aligned with what the Scripture is saying. John, maybe you're quoting about John. What about John? Because he was commanded to write it down. So in, in, in actuality, this is what's happening here. The impression that I'm spiritual than you, makinig kayo sa akin, I, I, I usually worship in the morning with angels. Wow, can you imagine all those claims? That in my devotion, I had the access to join the devotion of the angels, the worship of the angels. Do not let this anyone disqualify you a person who goes into a great deal, pinagyayabang nila what they have seen in their vision and so on and so forth, all these are actually unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head. Which head? Jesus is the head of the body, the church, the entire creation. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, the church, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Why? Because these religion, this false teachers, these mystic teachers, who were telling them that you have to experience this, you have to experience this, you have to feel like this, you have to do this, because this is the path to spiritual maturity and growth. Paul said, no. That is not the right path to spiritual maturity. It is actually your connection with the head. These guys, they have lost connection with Christ. And they're claiming that the way to spiritual maturity is other than Christ. That's wrong. The head is the one that sustains the nutrients in the body. That's the imagery of Apostle Paul here. If, you, if the body is disconnected from the head, how can the body grow? So the key point of Apostle Paul, you want to grow, you hold fast to the head. Maintain your vital connection and your union and relationship with Christ being the head because the growth, the true spiritual growth flows through the head from Christ to His body. Again, we're still in the theme of spiritual maturity. This is actually what the, the false teachers were trying to confuse them. The mystical way of doing it is the way to spiritual growth. Paul said, no. Spiritual maturity is ultimately attained only in Christ, the one from whom the body is nourished and united. You want to grow spiritually in your life? Maintain your vital connection with Christ. Understand who Jesus is and what He has accomplished for your life. Because spiritual maturity apart from the head is not true. Now verse 20. Here's the rhetorical question. We have covered the two warnings and two reasons that Apostle Paul mentioned. Why you should not allow those anyone to judge you or anyone to do the referee being umpire to disqualify you and rob you of the prize. Here's the rhetorical question. Again, just to reinforce what he has said to the Colossians. Since, now listen carefully, Colossians, and win SQ. Since you died with Christ. Diba? When you were baptized with Christ, you died with Christ. Remember, when you are buried, you rise again with Christ into new life. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces. Remember the, the spiritual thing that God has disarmed. Since you died with Christ to the spiritual elemental forces of this world, why? The rhetorical question. Why as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? If you already died with Christ, why as if that you live today, that you are still part of that? What is Paul trying to say? Now listen carefully. Death releases you from any legal uh, obligations when you were still alive. You are legally released from all the the things that, the, the agreements. A person who died is already released from the obligations, any commitments, from any legal obligations. So that's the picture here. Since you died in your old self, you're supposed to live in the new age. You're supposed to live in the new creation. You died ne, in the old world, in the old solidarities with the world. You died na in the 
as far as Christ is concerned, your old self has been buried sa ninth floor or sa east coast. Your old self has been buried and when you rose again, you rose into a new life. This is the argument. Why as if you belong to the old world and you submit to the rules of the Sabbath, what you eat, what you don't eat. Why do you still submit to those things? You died to it already. You see the argument of Apostle Paul? Because your dead, your death in Christ releases you from all those obligations of the law. Beautiful. Meaning, if we are believers in Christ, we died in our old life in this present evil age. Although we, still, we are still here in the present age, but we are now living in the age to come that was inaugurated by Christ. We are in the new creation. Live the new. That's why next Sunday he would do the practical thing. What does it mean to live now in the age to come? What is the implication of living in the new life? That's why he would say, put on the new self, put off the old self. He would use those words next, next Sunday. But again, the rhetorical question is, since you died with Christ to the elemental forces of this world, why as though you still belong to the world, the old solidarity with this evil world, do you submit to its rules? What are those rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Why, do you, why are you submitting yourself to all those things? You already died. You don't belong to 2022. Nag new year na eh. the, That's past. That's the old year. You're living in the new year. Expired na yun eh. The old is gone. The new has come. Why do you submit to that do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? These rules, which, you have, which have to do with things that, were, that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. And in last verse, such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, with their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgences. Na-attract kayo dahil it has an appearance of wisdom. Wow, siyempre nagpapasting. Ma- mahinahon, dahil mahina, hindi kumain eh. Magalang, at saka may kwento ng worship of angels, lagi nagdi-devotion, may vision. It attracts you because it has the semblance and the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship and false humility associated to their fasting and harsh treatment of their body, maaring sinasampal nila pag nagmumura sila, inukurot nila, nagsinungaling ka na naman. Di ba? Pinipingot mo sarili mo when you lie. Wow! Such an ideal person. Di ba? Bakit mo binabato ka sarili mo? Eh, late ako sa church eh. Late ako eh. Pag pumapasok sa church, ina- ina- bakit Brad? Kasi late eh. I was, I'm, I'm uh, harsh treating my body. You, they, you may have the appearance of Wisdom and religiosity and spirituality. But Paul said, but they lack any value in restraining sensual urgencies. The one that controls from within. <clears throat> you know what I remember here? Kasi to ascetism to. Ascetic ito. Eh, yung what you don't do. You, you, you hurt your body. You punish your body. Or you separate yourself. Deny yourself from any any pleasure or any worldly thing. Yung, hindi ako nanonood ng TV, hindi ako nanonood ng YouTube, hindi ako, hindi ako nagbabasa ng ano, I don't want to, I don't want to go out, I don't want to associate with, I'm, I'm gonna self-discipline myself so that I will have the path to maturity and I will seclude myself. Kaya yung mga monastic, the monas- monastery, they separated themselves away from the world because believing that they, that's the only way for them to attain spiritual maturity but you know the struggle of those who are in the monastery? I had a story one time. I read this story. The, the, the monks in the monastery, because they have to purge themselves from the lusts and the, in the indulgences of the flesh that they have to punish themselves whenever they would feel that. They have this kind of rule that if they have evil thoughts, lustful thoughts, the, this is the story I've read, the lustful thoughts of the monks in the, during the monastery time, what they would do, they would jump to the bushes with thorns to punish their mind and their body. So can you imagine at dinner time, you would know who have evil thoughts. Because, because oh, bakit, bakit galos-galos ka? Sorry. <laughs> can you imagine? Every day they would jump there because there is evil thoughts, lustful thoughts, and immoral thoughts which they could not control. Separating yourself is not the solution. Jesus did not command us Isolate yourself from the world. 
that you may not be contaminated. No. You know the beauty of the new creation? When you died to your old self and you rise alive in the new creation, God would give us new desire. Yes, there is still battle. Meron pa rin pong away eh, Because we're still living, our foot, our feet are still in this present evil age. But the Holy Spirit that is living in us is battling again. That's why we are commanded to continue to uh, follow the Spirit because there is battle within our hearts. There will be a war of, of thoughts. But God would give us a new desire. How many testimonies we have heard from people who radically changed. All of a sudden, their, their desire to smoke stop without any explanation because God gave them a new desire, evil thought. That's why Paul would say, read, fill your minds with what is good, what is honorable, what is true. Because punuin mo yung isipan mo para may panlabang ka sa masasamang isip. But if our minds is full, is empty with the word of God, there's nothing to fight. That's why when we, read the, when we read and continue to mature, we soak ourselves with God's Word and we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit. We always associate, we always grow with brothers and sisters and we follow God's prompting in our hearts. Slowly, you lumalabang ka eh because napupuno ka ng Word of God. Now, malumalakas yung Word of God, ang, ang banal na Spirit. Oh, you'll be able to control. That, that time, you don't become sinless but because you become sinning less. You get that? We are not... We don't become perfect right away, but we become, uh, we start to sin less. We're not sinless, but we are sinning less because we are following. We let the fruit of the Holy Spirit develop in us. Love instead of hate. Joy, di ba? So, nag-grow ka. Will you take root in the Word of God? You strengthen yourself in the faith and you overflow with thanksgiving. Nawawala yung bitterness, nawawala yung grumpiness, nawawala yung complaining. Instead, nagkakaroon ng overflowing of thanksgiving and gratitude. You see, maturity is developing and you're evolving. But you see the, you see the, the foolishness of what we are doing as human apart from Christ. So these false teachers, in summary, as I close, these false teachers in Colossae were advocating ascetism. Denying of pleasures and everything. Don't do this, don't do that. Mysticism, uh, teaching them of what they should do to feel like fasting and uh, that you may experience all this mystery. And legalism is you have to do this. You have to do this in order for you to, uh, to be able to grow into maturity. They are saying that these things is the path to spiritual growth. And Apostle Paul is arresting that and says spiritual maturity is not determined by adherence to dietary restrictions. Again, it's not what you eat that makes you spiritual. Or specific observances of holidays simply because you do the festival of the of the first fruit of pentecost kaya nga minsan nagka, why do some christians it's okay when we understand all those festivals we don't have to observe those festivals because jesus already fulfilled those maybe when we try to experience that it's okay to understand the festival it's okay but to believe that we have to we are obliged to and commanded to fulfill and still celebrate those festivals no even Sabbath. But if you want to observe rest, that's fine. But you're not commanded to do that. But if you want to do it, then don't be, let us not be saying, ako pastor talagang seven. It doesn't matter now. The Christians in the New Testament, in the entire New Testament, there is no command that Christians have to observe Sabbath. But if you want to do that, fine. But not because it adds to your merit to be accepted by Christ. Remember, these are shadows that is already has fulfillment in Christ. So, spiritual maturity is not determined by adherence to dietary restrictions, specific observance of holidays, or external rituals like fasting. Fasting is not bad, but you do fasting that you may know the will of God, not to be spiritual bad. Ilang, pa, ilang weeks ka na nagfasting, Brad? Ako 40 days na. Naka, four, naka tatlong 40 days. I'm more, uh, I have more medals than you. No, it has nothing to do with that. It is the fruit of a vital union with Christ. Hindi masama ang mag-fasting, mga kapatid. It's good if you do it the right way and with the right motive and intention to know God, but it has nothing to do with spiritual badge that because we fasted for 50 days or 100 days that we are more spiritual than those who have not experienced that. There are several reasons medically why people cannot, could not pass, fast because of medical reasons. So God is not grading us because of those things. Paul was asserting that the genuine path to spiritual maturity involves steadfastly holding on to Christ 
as the head. Why? Because all the nutrients and all the guidance will flow from the head to the body. These religious leaders have lost connection with the head, as the words of Apostle Paul. Rather than adhering to this misguided human rules. We are free in Christ, but do not use your freedom to put down on others or to abuse what Christ has given to us. Use your freedom, the new life that you have in Christ, to live in the fullness of God. Why? Why is this important? Because the promise age to come is now a present reality in Christ. We died in the old solidarity with the world. When we rose again in baptism, we rose with Christ. We live now in the promised reality in Christ. This life is different from that life. Don't submit again yourselves to the, all the regulations of that old life. You live your new life, which Christ, which we will talk about next week, but this is the challenge for us. Embody the new life you have in Christ. Put some flesh to it. Put some action to it. Embody. Ipamuhay natin ang bagong buhay. The new life that we have is the sign that we are in the new creation.